All right, it's 11.30 or at least one o'clock, so we will get started. Uh, Vincent, are you there? Yeah. Yes, you know, I'm here, yeah. Oh, perfect, okay. So our second speaker for this morning is Vincent Caudrelier from the University of Leeds, and you can see the title of his talk, Absorption Emission of Solidons by an Integrable Boundary in the Nonlinear Schrodinger Equation. So Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gino, and uh, thank you so much to the organizers for allowing me to uh, uh, participate remotely. Um, I wish I could have been here, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm stuck at home for personal reasons. So, I'm, but I'm hoping I can make make this up uh, in October, where I should be able to join the program in person. Um, so, uh, yeah, before I start, just uh, uh, some of you may have heard part of what I'm about to talk about uh, last year in the Bridge event. Uh, but uh, the good news is that there there, there have been developments since. Um, so. Uh, not just be all the same again. Um, and um, I'm going to uh, concentrate quite a lot on, on, on ideas and, and general results uh, and not so much on, on proofs um, or uh, on uh, rigorous analysis. So I apologize in the analysts in the audience uh, for that, but hopefully you will still get a good idea of what uh, this is about. Um, the plan, oops, if I can move it here. Uh, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time actually going over the history of subjects uh, because um, I, could, I could start essentially from uh, section three and four, but then uh, probably most of you would wonder why this is interesting or how this came about. So, so uh, I, I'm just going to walk you through how, how we got into uh, this topic of um, what we called time dependent boundary conditions and what are they for and, and why did they arise as uh, uh, um, a topic that should, should be studied, in, in our opinion. Um, <clears throat> and, and that will also, along the way, set the scene about the various uh, uh, perspective on the idea of integrable boundary conditions, um, which maybe some of you know, know one aspect very well, but not another aspect. And it's, it's the, the main message that it's really the, the, the fusion or, or the putting together of all the various perspectives that led to uh, us uh, wanting to study these time-dependent boundary conditions, which I will define uh, specifically what this means, obviously, so, so you know what this is about. And towards the end, I will offer some outlook and, and uh, perhaps some um, speculative open problems um, related to the, to the theme of the, of the program. First of all, I should check, so can anyone, can everyone see and hear me correctly? It's very hard to, so, yes, great stuff. Sorry, I should have asked first. Uh, the running example uh, that I'm uh, going to use to illustrate uh, everything really uh, is the uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, um, which uh, most of you know ex extremely well. Um, G is plus or minus one, it defines the regime, either focusing or defocusing. Uh, it's a partial differential equation, which is known to be integrable uh, because it can be formulated by a, a, a lax pair. And originally uh, in the early works, it was studied as an initial value problem on, on the full line, so on, for X uh, in the, on the real line, uh, with fixed initial condition uh, in some appropriate function space. So originally we did Schwartz space, uh, then People consider uh, L1 and perhaps also other, other functional space later on. Uh, for us, uh, what I will have in mind as an important property always in the background is appropriate decay at infinity to zero. So I will not be talking about finite, um, finite value boundary conditions at infinity, but what I will going to be talking about is uh, some special boundary conditions uh, at some fixed point in the real line, which we can choose to be uh, the origin x equals zero. So um, again, as is, as is well known, this, this, is, this is amenable, the system to the inverse scattering method or inverse scattering transform, what terminology you prefer to use. And the key object in this approach uh, is a lax pair, um, which I call u and v here, uh, which determines a linear uh, compatible problem for some auxiliary uh, object, uh, capital side, 
uh, what some people call the, uh, the wave function. And uh, it was shown very soon after these uh, pioneering works by Rubik's Cope, Neural, and Seger that uh, uh, much of the procedure uh, in the inverse scattering method is actually uh, um, understandable as a nonlinear version of the Fourier transform, uh, whereby you produce some uh, scattering data, which is the nonlinear analog of the Fourier modes. In time evolution, it's very simple for this uh, scattering data. And uh, well, the hard part, if you like, is to perform the inverse transform. And historically, this was done with the Gelfand and the Marchenko method. And, and uh, more, more and more, uh, the Riemann Hilbert formulation seems to be uh, taking over because it offers advantages, or, um, for instance, for long time asymptotic uh, studies, among other things. So, this is all very well known, of course. Um, then um, there is a, a, a companion. Uh, point of view on the uh, uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation, and actually many of the uh, partial differential equations that are called integrable and that are uh, um, formulated with a lax pair. It's a Hamiltonian point of view. So uh, the same system can be viewed as an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian system. Um, it's a bit special um, from the point of view of other dependent systems, uh, in the sense that uh, the Lagrangian is degenerate. But anyway, uh, you can uh, view uh, the phase space as being given by these coordinates, Q and its complex conjugate. You can formulate a Poisson structure on this phase space. And if you uh, take this functional to be your uh, Hamiltonian, then you can show that uh, Hamilton's equations are equivalent to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So, um, so far, these are two disjoint points of view. Um, and um, how can we talk about integrability from these two viewpoints? So again, depending on the background or terminology, um, the central objects will be called the scattering matrix or the monodromy matrix, They're the same thing. Um, and um, in the context of the lax pair formulation, uh, in fact, the existence of lax pair guarantees that you can construct uh, an infinite number of conserved quantities in time. And one quick way to view this is to calculate the time evolution of this object, the scattering matrix. Um, and you realize that, well, it's given by this uh, simple differential equation. So that's actually the key equation that shows the, the uh, scattering data has a simple time evolution. Uh, and if you take the trace of that, because you have a commutator, it tells you that um, whatever is in the trace uh, actually is time independent. Um, if you combine that with analytic properties of the scattering matrix in the spectral parameter lambda, uh, for NLS, you can show that it has a, uh, an expansion in one of the lambda, and actually the logarithm is the uh, better um, quantity to look at. Uh, then you can extract systematically some uh, functionals of, uh, of your, your fields, of your opportunities, and, and they will all uh, be conserved in times. And I have an infinite series of those independent. So in that context, that or that's why we would call um, the uh, PDE as being in integrable, having an infinite number of conserved quantities. In fact, conservation laws, uh, we'll come back to that later, is, is the signature uh, that the PDE is special. From the uh, Hamiltonian point of view, um, I don't want to say too much because uh, we'll take another talk. But um, there was a, a development um, in the late um, 80s, motivated by uh, uh, other, other, uh, other ideas, so the, the quantization of individual systems. But anyway, it gives uh, uh, this R matrix formalism, as it's called, um, introduced by Scalia, and it gives a, a quick way to characterize the same idea, but from a Hamiltonian point of view. And you can show with the Poisson bracket that I introduced earlier on, so using this custom bracket, uh, but written in a convenient fashion, um, you have this property. Uh, so uh, the um, trace of this lambda has some commute for different values of the spectral parameter. And this property is the Hamiltonian uh, counterpart of uh, this property here, the time independence, because hidden in one of those um, uh, when you expand S of lambda hidden in this, you have actually the Hamiltonian of the system. So one of these INs is actually the Hamiltonian of uh, the model under consideration. 
And uh, again, by the same argument, taking expansion in one over the spectral parameter, you, you have as a result, the involutivity as it's called of those quantities which become integrals of motion. In fact, um, so that's also taken as the signature of integrability, but in fact, it goes much beyond this uh, because there's actually a beautiful link between uh, the inverse scattering methods. So the full scattering matrix and um, the idea of action angle variables, um, which um, establishes actually a solution method in both formalism. So when you have uh, uh, the inverse scattering method, you can devise the traditional uh, method that I explained. So the direct approach and the inverse uh, um, um, transform to find your solutions. And this has a beautiful translation in terms of action and variables, which shows the integrability around UV and also gives you a way to have solutions in principle in the Hamiltonian setting. So this was a really uh, a very nice uh, discovery that founded uh, the, the modern era of integrable systems. And now you can ask, well, um, that was the story on, on the full line, but um, if I want to perhaps use this equation as a model uh, for more realistic situations, I would have perhaps to pose it on a finite interval or at the very least to, to warm up on the semi-infinite interval. Um, and then uh, you could just say, well, I'm gonna impose my favorite binary condition and see what happens. Unfortunately, chances are this is going to destroy uh, the, nice the nice properties uh, due to integrability. So you could take the uh, um, reverse point of view and say, okay, I I'm not gonna impose whatever I like, but um, see if I can identify integrable boundary conditions that would preserve nice features of integrability. So for instance, uh, if I pose the problem on the half line with some initial condition um, and perhaps some Dirichlet problem or no mind problem, the question would be, well, uh, if I put anything here as G0 of T or anything there, in general, I would be going to destroy integrability. So how can I choose those uh, well? And um, in fact, before I do that, I'm hoping I can switch to another uh, shared content because I wanted to show you a nice uh, video. Um, I like to show it because it's an experiment. Can you see this video clip now? Sorry, I'm not sharing, am I? Is this okay? Okay, right, apparently you can see. So, so initially, this, this is actually uh, an experiment for or showing uh, KDV soliton collisions. But uh, so it's not the main point is not about boundaries, but actually it's uh, there's a beautiful uh, uh, scene where you see what happens when soliton bounces on some boundary, which is just now it reflects and it's perfectly um, reflected and preserves its quantity, its um, its properties. Uh, what they wanted to demonstrate, I think, was actually um, that you have elastic collision of the two um, solitons. So you see something very special happened when the first soliton bounced off the, um, the boundary. And um, if I go back to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, we can perhaps imagine that for some well-chosen boundary conditions, uh, something similar will happen. So there are two issues. So first of all, is there a nice way to identify uh, so, such uh, uh, boundary conditions that would preserve integrability? And, and then once you identify those, uh, it would be nice to actually be able to describe the solutions uh, of the problems using uh, some adaptation of uh, the inverse scattering method or inverse scattering transform. So um, the earliest work that tackled this uh, problem and that I know of uh, and, and provided a, an answer for, for the two uh, aspects, so identifying uh, nice boundary conditions on the half line and providing solutions and an adaptation of the inverse scattering method uh, is this work of Ablovitz and Seger in 75 and 
well, they use the analogy of the uh, scattering, uh, sorry, the inner scattering method with the uh, linear Fourier transform to um, provide a solution for um, homogeneous Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions using the idea of odd even extension that you would do for a linear problem uh, in terms of the Fourier transform. It means you would use the sine or cosine uh, Fourier transform. And uh, because of the nice analogy between the inverse scattering method and the Fourier transform, these ideas uh, could, could, could go over to, um, uh, to the set of for, for uh, non-linear Schrodinger, for instance. So then uh, much later, actually, um, Skyani introduced an efficient method to identify the global boundary conditions. Uh, so these two Neumann and Dirichlet are part of it, but there is more. It's actually a lot, lot more. That's the, that's the part, that's the topic of today, actually. So uh, originally, uh, uh, these papers and more, more than just Neumann and Dirichlet, also homogeneous Robin boundary conditions were identified as being integrable. So what do we mean by integrable? I'm going to explain that in a minute, but there is a way to show that you still have an infinite number of conserved quantities, both in the lax pair formalism and the Hamiltonian formalism. So in that sense, you know that these integrable boundary, these boundary conditions uh, are good for you. Um, but nothing was said in that paper about then how to build solutions once you've identified the uh, initial boundary value problem. That came a little bit later. Uh, before I describe the solution methods, uh, let me review um, how you would identify boundary conditions that are integrable. So uh, it's a sufficient criterion, and I'm going to illustrate it on the half line because that's going to be the topic for today. So um, if I now consider the problem on the half line instead of having the monodromic matrix or the scattering matrix of the uh, full line, so relating your two your solutions, you now have a half-line scattering matrix relating uh, your solution normalized at infinity to uh, a, a fundamental solution normalized at x equals zero, for instance. So that's your fundamental um, uh, object now, which is defined uh, from your initial data. And, and then Scanning proposed to define this quantity. So you take your half scattering matrix, insert some matrix at the moment undetermined, but depending on the spectral parameter. Uh, so the, sorry, the inverse of the uh, scattering matrix of minus lambda. And then you close um, with the half scattering matrix plus lambda. Essentially, you do, you do a loop from uh, plus infinity down to the uh, origin uh, where the boundary, matrix, boundary conditions are coded in K, and then you go back to infinity by taking the trace you, you, you cycle um, around. So what's the statement? So now I said, if K is a solution of this equation, this particular equation, so V here is the um, lax matrix in the time part of the auxiliary problem, there's a, a, a change from lambda to minus lambda. So if you can find a solution like that, a constant in, in, in T, but uh, with some dependence on lambda, then automatically this quantity that has been introduced is time independent. And it will also have, again, I mean, depending on how you choose lambda, but um, uh, for all known examples, it will have an, an expansion in, in, in one of the lambda from which you can uh, derive or extract modified um, quantities, so that's the little b means there's a boundary now, uh, which essentially are going to be your uh, quantities that we had before in, uh, on the full line with extra terms accounting for the presence of the boundary and, and, and coding the boundary conditions. But in any case, you still have an infinite number of them and, uh, and, and they're conserved in time. So from this point of view, we say, okay, uh, whatever these boundary conditions are, uh, they are good from the point of view of, of integrability. And you can actually read off, once you have found what the uh, K matrix should be, this equation actually tells you what the boundary conditions are. And uh, it turns out that uh, I will show you in a minute uh, that the, the Robin boundary conditions are the ones that appear with this condition. Now, what about the Hamiltonian point of view? Uh, again, I don't expect you to know what the R matrix is, but just, just take it as a criterion uh, on this matrix K. 
which constrains it because this matrix is known. It's a quadratic equation in K. Uh, these labels one and two mean that actually I work in some tensor product. So if your K matrix is two by two, this is actually a matrix equality uh, for matrices of size four by four. That's a technical detail. Um, the point is that you can uh, try and write an enzyme from the form of K uh, as a function in, in, in the spectral parameter. And knowing this equation, try and solve for it. And I'll come back to that later on. So the reason why I just flashed this equation without much more explanation is because the comparison of these two criteria is very, it's, it's exactly what led us to, 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 to go beyond the Robin boundary conditions. Uh, so for the moment, just take it as some criterion, convenient criterion to find some um, boundary matrices. And again, the analog of uh, having conserved quantities in the max pair formalism has a Hamiltonian counterpart in the form of having Poisson relativity of these quantities. So, okay, um, uh, the summary is that we have, according to Sklenin, two ways of um, finding boundary conditions that will preserve integrability, either from the point of view of Black pairs or from the point of view of the Hamiltonian formulation. So then you can go and, and then just try and find what these k's should be. Uh, and then solve, try and find explicit solutions. So that's the second aspect of the problem. What about constructing solutions? So uh, there are two, I said traditional, um, because, well, we're in 2022, so actually most of them are over, uh, these two are over 20 years old, uh, whereas there's a much more recent one uh, that is still in, in, in its infancy. Uh, it's just going to mention it in passing. So one that is called, uh, 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 well, that I like to call nonlinear mirror image method. Uh, I think Gino actually introduced uh, this uh, very suggestive uh, uh, terminology. Uh, and it's really uh, the idea originally uh, advocated in Lloyd Seger to, 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 to take the mirror image uh, idea, but implement it um, for these nonlinear PDEs. And um, the key idea is this, to map the initial problem on the half line to a problem on the full line in a certain way using a superposition principle. But of course, uh, a linear superposition position principle is not going to do the trick because we have nonlinear PDEs, so you need a nonlinear version of it. And again, because these PDEs are uh, uh, integrable and have lots of beautiful properties, there is actually a nonlinear version of the superposition property, which is implemented by uh, double backroom transformations. So this, this is the essence of this method, and I will come back to that uh, in, in a bit more detail later on. Um, so um, much later, well, later on, uh, there's a, a, another solution method that emerged, um, partly because this has limitations in particular on the, uh, uh, it has limited conditions or constraints on the uh, uh, dispersion relation of the linearized version of PD that you can consider. So this mirror image uh, works well if your um, uh, dispersion relation is even function of the spectral parameter. But for instance, for the KDV, it was a, a bit of a headache. Um, so it was one of the motivations to introduce uh, this other point of view, um, now called the unipart transform or the forecast method, which actually uh, developed into much more than, than just, uh, you know, uh, an alternative to this, to this method. Um, and then the idea is that you, you, you remove the need to map to uh, uh, an initial value problem on the full line. So, so you remove the constraint on having a, a, an even, um, an even uh, dispersion relation. Uh, the price to pay, actually quite a few prices to pay, but uh, uh, one price to pay is to uh, form the spectral analysis of both parts of the Lexper simultaneously. So you end up with two sets of scattering data instead of just one built on your uh, initial conditions. You also have one set built on the um, on the um, uh, sorry the boundary data that you give yourself. And much much more recently, so last year, yeah, last year, 
uh, there was an adaptation of the inner scattering method on the half line, which is kind of midway between uh, uh, Sklenin's philosophy and, and the forecast method's philosophy. So you do not map on the full line. So you, you only use objects uh, on, on the half line, uh, but you choose your fundamental solutions well enough that the scattering matrix that naturally appears is actually Sklenin's double matrix, so the one when you uh, go back and forth on the half line. Um, and uh, it, it's quite an ingenious uh, uh, way that the uh, adaptation that fills the gap um, sort of between these two and screen. Uh, I won't say much more about that. To, for, for, for today, I want to uh, focus on, on the first solution method. Uh, at any point, if there are questions or if I go too fast, uh, please feel free to, to interrupt. It's very, very, uh, unfortunately, I'm not present, so I cannot see the reactions on the, on the audience. Um, so let me focus on uh, this nonlinear memory emergent method. So as I said, the idea is to uh, uh, extend to the nonlinear world this idea of uh, superposition of solutions uh, and the idea of all even extensions. So the technical tool to realize this idea is to use double backroom transformations, which map uh, the wave function of for a solution of one lax auxiliary problem to a new uh, wave function solution of a new auxiliary problem for a new uh, lax pair, uh, the bridge between the two or the transformation is realized by this matrix, which I'm going to call L in the rest of the talk. And what it does, it's realized some transformation on the old potential to a new potential. And to implement the idea of what even extension, you're going to require um, some holding condition, um, uh, which is that the result of applying this backroom transformation should be related to the uh, original potential uh, as plus or minus u of minus x. So this is the idea of all even extension. Okay, so it works really well to do that. Um, some technicalities is that, well, for, for this procedure to work and to map a lax pair into a lax pair, this uh, double matrix cannot just be anything. It has to satisfy certain conditions. So one of them is that its uh, X derivative should be related uh, to itself via the old and new uh, lax pair U. And there is a, a counterpart in T, which is quite essential and I'm going to, to tell you about in a minute. So, but first of all, uh, just by looking at this one, uh, the original observation of uh, Abi Goulin and then Tarasov and uh, Mikhaev, uh, and the early workers on, on, on this idea is the following. So hidden in this uh, equation, actually, if you take L to be first order and lambda, there are actually two equations, uh, um, differential equations. One that allows you to construct L entirely in terms of the original potential, and then the other one tells you what the new potential is in terms of the old potential and L. So viewed as a differential equation for L, I can try and solve it uh, given U and uh, fix some value uh, at x equals zero. So that should, you know, by general um, principle on, on differential equation, that should fix a, a solution for me. Uh, and then I can compute the resulting new potential. And then as a second stage, you're going to say, well, of all the possible initial potentials, let me pick those that are so special that actually the outcome of this operation uh, satisfies the, form, the folding con condition. And if that is realized, then automatically, when you look at what this uh, equation is telling you, you realize that actually the potentials that you, or the solutions that you, that you're looking at, automatically satisfy the Robin boundary condition. So this parameter theta is the parameter that characterizes the um, boundary condition, and it's the one that appears in this uh, matrix. I should say here, sigma three is the diagonal matrix one minus one. Um, so that was the, the, the observation, which together with a, a screening criterion, which also tells you that this is a solution of this criterion, uh, tells you that the Robin can, boundary conditions are integrable and give us a mean to actually construct solutions um, in the following way. All I have to do, if you like, is to pick 
appropriate potential that uh, satisfy this uh, constraint. And um, because we want to implement this idea from the inverse scattering point of view, the best way to do that is to understand what this means in the spectral side. So how do I choose my scattering data conveniently to ensure that this is going to be true? And then I can read off. I mean, I could reconstruct the solution using your favorite method, get from the Marchenko or Riemann Hilbert. So, um, well, let me skip these parts. I mean, that's just a technical detail. Now, um, I told you there's a, a time counterpart to the compatibility condition that the spectral matrix must satisfy that relates now the old uh, V matrix to the new uh, V matrix. And if I look at what the first step of the construction means from the point of view of this equation. So if I implement the following condition and look at what this means at x equals zero, I obtain this equation. Okay, so the value of L at x equals zero, it's time derivative. This V tilde under the folding condition becomes actually the V of the old uh, like matrix, but at minus lambda. And we have this condition three, which could say, okay, it is what it is, but actually it, it contains the boundary conditions explicitly. So if I go back to the most well known example, uh, that was already presented. So if I choose L to be um, this constant matrix and you plug in here, well, it's a constant matrix, so its time derivative is zero. And if I identify now the value at x equals zero of L with what Sklianin called the matrix K, then I just recover its criterion for integrability. So from this point of view, the uh, uh, you know the loop is is um, is closed. Um, Sklianin integrability uh, criterion is indeed uh, encoded in um, the nonlinear mirror image approach, uh, which also gives you a solution method. So now I said, well, it gives you a solution method, and I said the best way to understand it is to try and translate what this funding condition means on the scattering data associated to this potential U. And what it means is that you're gonna to have to um, consider uh, initial data that has special Z2 symmetries on its scattering data in order to automatically um, create solutions that will satisfy the uh, boundary conditions at X equals zero. Uh, what one such property is that if lambda zero is one of the uh, discrete eigenvalues or, or zeros of the scattering data associated to U. Uh, yeah, associated to U. Automatically, so uh, must be minus lambda zero star. And to each of these eigenvalues, there is an associated normal constant. So to these other eigenvalues, there's going to be another associated normal constant. And they cannot be choosed randomly and independently. They have to be related in a special way, which is completely calculable. And um, once you have that, what it means for pure solid solutions, for instance, is that if I want to construct a one solid solution that is going to be reflected off the boundary and satisfy Rabin boundary conditions uh, at x equals zero, so this is an xt plot, x equals zero is here, so your boundary is here, you have an incoming soliton which is reflected and bounces back so so this picture is actually the, the plot of this video i showed you uh it's the analog sorry for nls of the video i showed you which was for, for kdd but really in in reality what you're doing to uh, obtain this plot is uh, if i show you a contour plot is that you're now constructing a two soliton solution on the full line this is your boundary viewed as a mirror now and this condition uh, that lambda zero and minus lambda zero star should be, both be zeros tells you that if one soliton comes with uh, some incoming velocity, automatically you've got a mirror one that comes with minus the velocity and the same amplitude. And the condition on norm and constant is such that they um, interact uh, precisely in the way that it looks like the soliton is uh, satisfying the 
um, boundary conditions of interest. So that's the spirit of these, of these symmetries. Okay, um, just checking time. Right, so the summary is that we have scanning methods which allows you to identify uh, acceptable boundary conditions. Uh, there is various solution methods, which I've already described. Uh, the one I focus more is the non numerator method. In solution method two, so in the forecast method, uh, um, there is in fact a special class of boundary conditions called linear, linearizable boundary conditions, which are identified by a condition which is very much the same as Sklenin's condition, um, if you make the proper identifications, but except that because you don't have to map to the full um, line, um, a forecast was able to go uh, further and actually um, um, consider transformations here for dispersion relations are odd. So that was kind of, that's, that's what you gain from this point of view. Otherwise for NLS, it's just the same. Um, uh, so what's the uh, summary of uh, um, the, this historical review? So hopefully I didn't spend too much time, but um, really the point is that is, is when you try to fit everything together that you realize there's a bit of a gap. And the bit of a gap is actually in, uh, Sklenin's original paper. So if you look at these two criterions, here we have a criterion to find some matrices K, which is this reflection equation, some kind of equation. And then we have this other criterion in the lax approach, which gives you the Robin boundary condition. This one uh, is well understood uh, as I've explained, so you understand how it relates to the solution method one. Um, the connection two is the one I mentioned that by our linearizable boundary conditions. And the relation between this point of view was worked out by uh, Gino and Okasa Chabalski on for NLS. So it's also understood how, how this works. But in fact, um, let me explain these question marks because that's where everything comes from. So on the one hand, let me take this criterion and look at the condition at the, at the possible solutions when I uh, look at K as a first order in lambda matrix. And then you find that automatically that's your only solution, which is the one that was already known uh, and gives you Robin boundary conditions. It's constant, it's diagonal. Okay, fair enough. Now, if you actually make the same answers for K of lambda, you look at, look at it as a um, other one polynomial in, in lambda, and insert in the reflection equation, you have a bit more freedom. So instead of have just having the diagonal one minus one here, you have a full SL2 matrix. You can always rescale, okay, normalization is not fixed by those equations. So you could always rescale to have one minus one here, but now we have two new ingredients, B and C. Um, in fact, for NLS, C would be related to B star, but if you don't take into account the symmetry of NLS, in general, you have these uh, off diagonal terms. So what's going on here? Um, I've got two criterion which seem very good enough at identifying particular boundary conditions, but they don't give me the same solution class of solutions for the simplest answers. Um, so um, one reason why we become very we became very interested in this understanding this uh, solution is because. If you take the analogous uh, solution in the quantum world, um, these off diagonal parameters they actually control um, hopping terms or well, transmission into the uh, boundary and transmission back into the system. And they've been used very uh, um, uh, fruitfully with this, with this in mind. But in the classical world is what's, what's going on. Uh, and first of all, um, how could I ever imagine taking such a solution, describing what the corresponding boundary conditions are and fitting it with uh, the uh, nonlinear mirror image method, which seems to rely on this equation. So, so we, well, we thought about that and um, we resolved the issues in the following way. So it's gonna look a bit like it's coming from nowhere, but let me explain why we did that. So we went back to the Hamiltonian formalism um, uh, from Sklenin spirits. And let me take now some arbitrary boundary matrix K and ask the question, what's its time evolution under the boundary Hamiltonian that I can construct from uh, this um, uh, generating function, 
from spree onions, uh, let's capture in the matrix, if you like, boundary matrix. Calculate what this should be. And I can calculate this uh, Poisson bracket, which will give me the time evolution of K. And you find an equation that always has a structure that we, 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 we've already seen several times. So it's some matrix of minus lambda, the uh, matrix K minus itself, and then this term, yeah, yeah, you have lambda. There's a reason why this is a small k minus at this stage and why this is not b at this stage, the lax pair, and that's actually the crux of the matter. This uh, matrix can be completely determined by k itself, the R matrix of the model. So it's actually something you can compute. And now here's the connection with the above apparent issue. So what's going on? Well, if I choose k lambda to be the Robin matrix constant diagonal, and I insert into this equation, where well, the left-hand side is zero because it's constant. And this matrix you can calculate is like nothing but the lax matrix V uh, evaluated at x equals zero. So then everything's fine. You recover um, it's clear in this criterion and also uh, the equation that appears in the nonlinear mirror image method. But if I take now this solution as my K minus, with some off diagonal terms, the situation is very different. So then um, this matrix here that you can calculate is no longer the value of the lax matrix as zero. It's this plus some terms, which actually capture the new features of the off diagonal terms. So to go back to what we know and what we like, um, from the point of view of the non-linear mirror image method, we need to perform a gauge transformation localized at x equals zero, um, which transform M into V, so the lax matrix of the problem uh, um, uh, evaluated at x equals zero. But this gauge transformation, which is time dependent, is gonna have a uh, non-trivial influence of my, on my matrix, original matrix, which was constant, but now it becomes a time dependent matrix which I'm going to call K of T lambda to emphasize the time dependence. So this is the matrix that is constant with the off diagonal terms. And that's the resulting uh, K matrix, which is now going to satisfy this equation with the uh, lax matrix that we like. So, so in the summary of, of this technical passage is that to understand, to reconcile uh, the two points of view uh, in Sklianin's work, we are naturally led to a time-dependent version of Sklianin's criterion. So that's the new, the new feature. Um, and, and you can't escape it, escape it. It's just, it's there. So now if I compare this equation to the um, equation required of the background matrix, well, it, it's just, you know, direct identification. Uh, if I identify L zero T lambda with this matrix, boundary matrix time dependent, then they're exactly the same equation. So now if you like, we're, we're in business, there is hope that now we can implement the uh, ideas of the nonlinear mirror edge method, but extend it to this time dependent um, uh, um, version. Um, and actually see what can happen to solutions for these new boundary conditions. So this is what we uh, did. First, we did it for, in fact, the Ablovitz Ladic for, well, for several reasons, but one, one main reason is technical is because this discrepancy is very hard to handle in uh, the continuous, uh, in the continuous case of NLS, but it's much easier to see what's going on in the discrete uh, version, space discrete. So, so we did that first for Ablovitz Ladic, and then we took some continuous limit of that. Uh, and this is now what I want to present. So if you do that, um, well, the calculation gives you what it gives you. So instead of the Robin boundary condition, you have this horrible looking boundary condition on uh, your function u at x equals zero, which involves a time derivative of u, some uh, uh, two parameters as opposed to just one before, and then highly nonlinear linear square roots, uh, cubic terms, et cetera, et cetera but it is exactly equivalent to this important uh, equation, uh, which I can call the boundary zero curvature equation. 
uh, when k is taken in this form, um, um, so here you see the parameters of the boundary and the time dependence is, is encoded in this uh, little term here, uh, proportional to lambda. And it involves the value of, uh, of, the, of the solution at t equals zero. Uh, here I put proportional because as I said, uh, if you want a K matrix with like properties, you would, you would put some uh, normalization here, but the normalization has no um, consequence on, on the physics. Okay, so you, you have these boundary conditions. What do you do with them? What do they mean? What do they uh, do to your solutions? Um, first of all, it should be noted that these boundary conditions have actually appeared in the history, uh, you know, every 10 years or so uh, by different authors from completely different point of view, et cetera, et cetera. The most recent one before our work was, was uh, Dunbon in 2014. Uh, but no solutions were uh, studied. So now with, with our understanding that there is hope to implement the nonlinear mirror mesh method, we, we, we went and did it. And uh, to appreciate the novelty uh, or, or what happens as compared to the well-known Robin case, let me first recall uh, the results of the Robin case uh, and the spectral characterization uh, of uh, in that case. So, um, as I said, so one key idea is to select uh, a potential or a solution that has this uh, property in the real coordinates. And this translates on a whole bunch of conditions on the corresponding scattering data for such a potential. Um, I'm going to concentrate on, on what's in, in, in purple uh, because that would be uh, what had the condition on the continuous spectrum, but later on, I'm gonna be interested on the pure soliton uh, solution. So let me concentrate on these two things. So this uh, symmetry property is what I've already mentioned. It tells you that if a lambda zero is one of a discrete eigenvalues of uh, A, if you're working in focusing regime, then minus lambda star necessarily is also. Uh, uh, like the value with, with the understanding that I explained that you have for each solid and you have a mirror image one. And the accompanying uh, constraint on the norming constant. So if you have a norming constant associated to one zero and then the norming constant associated to the uh, mirror image zero, they're not free, but they have to satisfy this constraint. And it's completely uh, characterized by the um, parameter of the um, boundary condition. So this gamma is related to the parameter of the boundary condition um, by our sign, which depends on the soliton content of your solution. Okay, so that's the key message. So we have a, a spectral characterization of solutions that will, on the half line, that will satisfy the correct boundary conditions. This is, um, the key point is to check that this is um, uh, compatible with time evolution, but, but it works. So now we want to repeat the same thing or derive the same sort of results, but for these new boundary conditions. Um, so there are two aspects. First of all, um, you can take L to be a product of two elementary backlink matrices of this form. So that's the one that would be used for just Robin, but you take a product, a well-chosen product of two of those. And, um, and then you have to fix uh, they obey a differential equation and you have to fix some condition to fix your solution uniquely. But it turns out that this, um, as opposed to the rubbing case, instead of fixing the value at x equals zero, uh, which by construction is time dependent and leads to all sorts of issues, um, we, it's much more convenient to fix the condition at infinity where then you have a constant um, solution. And then you have to prove that indeed the unique solution that you constructed is exactly equal to the boundary matrix you want at x equals zero. So it is possible, uh, it's done, and then you can deduce uh, the spectral characterization uh, of the potentials that will satisfy this very complicated looking boundary condition. And now there's a novelty. So there's one class of solution that looks very much like the Robin case. So I've emphasized the same sort of um, uh, relations for the soliton content. So here again, you have this equation that tells you that if lambda k is a zero, then minus lambda k is also a zero. And that's the corresponding constraint on the norming constant. More complicated because the 
um, the uh, boundary conditions are more complicated, but the structurally the same idea. Uh, they are completely controlled by the boundary parameters. These constraints. And now there's a new possibility. So now A has to satisfy some symmetry condition, but now the complicated uh, function, which was before on B, is actually now appearing on A. Uh, and well, it's just a fact of life that the constraint of the corresponding normal constant is minus one, but um, let's look at what this means. Let's, let me walk you through this. Well, it means that um, in fact, in addition to having zeros that come in pair, like we had before, there's gonna be one zero, which is, well, either this one or this one, depending on the signs, but one particular zero that is determined by the boundary parameters. And this new zero actually allows you to have solitons that are absorbed or emitted when they have exactly this uh, uh, zero. The norming constant for this particular soliton is not constrained as opposed to the mirror one. So in pictures, here's what you have. If I take the, the first case, which is very much like the Robin case, you could have, for instance, a two soliton solution uh, being reflected. So uh, they interact either before or after being reflected. So this is plotted for the same eigenvalues, uh, but for different norming constants. So you have shifts in position uh, that are different. And now the new scenario is that you could have one soliton that is reflected and another one that's absorbed. Uh, but the one that's absorbed has a very special uh, parameter content. So the norm constant is free, but its velocity and amplitude are controlled by the boundary parameters. And again, if you change the norm constant, you can have different uh, collision scenarios. Uh, the reason why I plot various scenarios is, is because you can see that all the collisions are elastic. Uh, of course, everything is integrable, but um, um, yeah, now you have this, this new feature. So what's going on? Um, I said this is integrable, but now imagine I want to compute the first um, supposedly conserved quantity on the half line. So I take the charge, so that's known to be the uh, density of a potentially conserved charge and I integrate on the half line. And if I take as one of the solution, the one that is, for instance, uh, absorbed or, or emitted, uh, you can actually compute this explicitly and you find this answer. And you look, when you look at this answer, you see that when T is plus infinity, uh, well, depending on the sign. So in one, one limit, you get, um, sorry, it should be two alpha. It's alpha plus alpha. Um, and the other limit is zero. So the interpretation of that is that your soliton is either on the half line at minus, uh, minus infinity, and then indeed it gets absorbed by the boundaries, so it disappears from the half line. But obviously then it tells us that it's not conserved in time. So what's going on? Well, it turns out that using the boundary uh, matrix and the fact that um, it's integrable, you can construct a quantity that depends on the boundary parameters that exactly compensates this loss. So in fact, this combination now is the uh, right combination for a conserved quantity. And that's how integrability should be understood right, in this context, as I'm going to explain in a minute. So what it means is that if you remember, it's quite nice because I was saying these off diagonal parameters, uh, at least quantum mechanically, they can be viewed as particle hopping into the boundary or appearing. And classically, the solitons realize exactly this idea that actually the half-line system now is now open and you can have a soliton hopping in and disappearing and charging your uh, boundary. But if you consider the, the coupled system half-line plus boundary, then that's a closed and integrable system. Indeed, this is just the first of actually uh, a series of infinite number of conserved uh, relations. So for each um, conserved quantity on the, sorry, would be conserved density on the half line, you can exactly compensate and have uh, something that is dependent on the boundary on. So it's, there's explicit formulas for that. I'm going to skip the derivation, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, well, well known. And now um, I want to move on to the last part, yeah, because time is running which is to say, well, there is a pattern actually in the structure of these time-dependent matrices. 
And it's actually very reminiscent of, of the dressing method for solitaires. So what's the idea? Well, if I look at the simplest one that was known for you know, 30, 40 years, uh, up to some normalization, which I said it uh, can be fixed. It has this structure and taking into account this normalization, which I'm not writing, it has a determinant of this force, which is a simple rational function. The, 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 the new but still simplest time-dependent boundary condition that I, I showed you before has uh, this more complicated matrix, but in terms of the determinant is the next simple, simplest um, uh, rational fraction. So it's now it's two, the product of two rational fraction characterized by a, a complex number. And now they can have real and imaginary parts. So naturally you say, well, let's play this game. And it seems very natural to say, well, what about higher order boundary matrices or higher order, uh, um, higher order dependency in Lambda? Uh, and that's what we, we, we looked at in, the, in this most recent work. And let me summarize the results for you. So that's the determinant of the matrix I would like to consider. It's known to be a constant and let me choose it in this form. So you do that because of symmetry reasons and because of the pattern I was just mentioning. And the way to read it is the following. If n is zero, you don't have this term. And if you take m equals one, that will reproduce the Robin boundary condition. If m is zero and n equals one, that reproduces the simplest time-dependent boundary condition that I just showed you. And in general, you could imagine to have this structure. Again, it, this is supported by symmetry arguments. And these two integers are going to fix the class of boundary conditions that you are considering, and they will all be integrable by construction. Now, you can ask, well, what do they look like? Uh, it's not very eliminate. You can write them down. It's not very eliminating to write them down. So I just flash this big formula just to show you it can be done, but you don't learn too much from it. Other than in general, you have a, a, a nth order time dependent um, yeah, boundary condition. What's more interesting and easier to understand is the spectral characterization of these higher order uh, boundary conditions, and you can go through the motion of what we did for, for uh, previously for the simplest ones. And uh, the key fact is in this formula. And that's the generalization of this formula here, where the new feature of the soliton being absorbed appeared. So how to read this formula? The first term would be give you n soliton that are paired. So a soliton mirror image. So they're the solitons that are going to be reflected. And you have corresponding constraints on the normal constant. These guys are going to be, I think, uh, emitted solitons whose velocity and amplitude are controlled by these boundary parameters. And these guys are going to be absorbed solitons whose similarly velocity and amplitudes are going to be controlled by these boundary parameters. So you have a set of boundary parameters and you see you have some combinatorial aspects. So you can play now all sorts of games. You could say, let me take an nth order boundary condition, pick two emitted solitons, three absorbed solitons, and 55 uh, reflected solitons. And, and, and that will be uh, a solution to your problem. Uh, so of course, we didn't plot such a complicated thing. But just to show you that you can have two absorbed uh, solitons, uh, sorry, two emitted here. Well, on the plot, you can't see they're absorbed or emitted. You, just, you need to know the parameters to know what's going on. But there's a lot of uh, phenomena that, 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 that can go on. Um, so to summarize, yes, and to conclude, um, the message I wanted to take is that, in fact, uh, um, so we were led to consider these time-dependent boundary conditions because we wanted to understand the two criterion that's clear in and how they relate. And if you want to do that, you have no choice because this new solution that the reflection equation tells you about can only be understood from the point of view of, of, of um, the, non, the lax pair point of view and the non mirror image point of view if you allow for time dependent uh, K matrices. And then it fits very well with the philosophy of the non mirror image method. It could be, uh, the idea can be extended. But, but then we discovered that when you do that, you have this, this phenomenon of absorption emit, uh, emission. So it was very much a curiosity and kind of just an academic uh, result. Like, okay, I have a soliton, but it has to be very fine-tuned. 
you know, his parameter, its parameters have to match the boundary parameters, and then it can be emitted or, or, or absorbed. So, so what? Um, but then, well, let me skip that. But then I, I was, uh, I thought, I was thinking about the theme of, of this, um, of this, uh, of this program, and I thought, well, uh, this idea of soliton gas actually could, I don't know. Here I'm very, you know, there are the experts in the audience, so um, I apologize in advance. This is a bit, a, a bit silly, but I was thinking, well, um, the idea of soliton gas is is to send the number of solitons so on the half line. Solitons are reflected to infinity, and then consider some statistical um, uh, distribution of the soliton parameters and the norming constant. So what if we could somehow get the same idea, but now for the parameters linked to the boundaries. So you send the number of boundary parameters to infinity, and then you start having uh, possibly in a commensurate fashion. So not just sending that to infinity and then keeping that finite. Uh, and then you could imagine possibly that the physical interpretation of such, such a model would be a solid on gas coupled to a boundary which acts as a, as a, a res reservoir. So there would be a, a probability of some of the solitons being absorbed or some of the solitons being emitted from this reservoir. Could this be relevant to some experiments? You know, is that even imaginable uh, to have a, a, an experimental realization? What behavior could we expect, you know, depending on how these, um, these numbers scale? Would we see anything interesting, at least academically? Um, um, you see, this is very, very speculative, but I thought um, this would be a great uh, platform perhaps to, to, to go beyond uh, uh, the results that we have, uh, that are, they are what they are, um, but I uh, thought so maybe we could go further. And on this note, I thank you very much for uh, your attention. Thank you, Vincent. <laughs> Questions? Roberto has a question. Yes, I uh, wonder if you could comment or expand on, on um, uh, KDV case. You showed an experiment that presumably was governed by KDV and uh, uh, what are these um, uh, the applications thereof? So you mean KDV with, with the boundary conditions? Yes, of course, with yeah, boundary yeah. conditions. Right. So well, so for KDV, uh, yeah, I went very fast. But uh, the crux of the matter is that you fall into well, you fall into these superficial limitation of the nonlinear mirror method, which seems to indicate that you would have to have a dispersion relation that is uh, an even function. Whereas for KDV, you would have your dispersion relation in the spectral parameter with the um, lambda cubed, for instance, uh, in, which, uh, in which case things seem to fall apart, although I have some ideas on how to restore that. So then you would have to use, at the moment, uh, you would have to use the um, uh, forecast method point of view. Uh, where you would be able to identify some integrable boundary conditions. Uh, I think some of them are described in, in, in this book. Um, so you can find some matrix N and uh, you can find this uh, function lambda in such a way that uh, within this method, you can construct solutions by eliminating the uh, scattering data associated to the uh, boundary data and then express actually essentially everything in terms of the, the, the scattering data of your initial condition using the symmetries that this uh, equation uh, triggers. Um, and I don't know if your question is, is about if some of these integrable boundary conditions would actually be the ones that we see in the movie. This I don't know, um, perhaps. But uh, if that's the question, I'm not, I'm not sure. But the, the, the answer is that you can attack the problem of constructing solutions um, within this method, it's more difficult to obtain explicit kind of multi soliton solution within this, uh, this, this method. Um, that's why if you want to think about solitons, usually I prefer the nonlinear mirror image method. It's more direct because you can use right. dressing ideas. Um, whereas here, uh, the dressing, dressing ideas within the forecast method, that's, that's not be developed at all, actually, or barely. Thanks. 
because we're over time, maybe we should stop here. And I'm sure Vincent is available for any questions online. Uh, but let's thank the speakers this morning. The 